Good afternoon and Merry Christmas. <laughs> um, today we have uh, Dr. Or Richard Campbell and he has done programs for us in the past. He's a self-made historian, retired postal worker who's very interested in history. So we're very pleased to have him. Um, next, next month on January 14th, we have Byron Shaw and he's doing a program on our African wilderness adventures. So we're visiting Africa, Africa again in January. Um, we have a special program in January, and Michael Eckers, who's written books on um, the Civil War, is coming, and he's going to talk about the Iron Brigade of the Civil War, and that's January 30th in the evening. So I hope you have good weather and you'll all join us. Our first Thursday film is Murder, She Said on January 2nd. So right away after the first of the year, we're going to get started with programming. And we have our gingerbread house exhibit. So if you haven't seen that yet, please stop in and see it. It's wonderful to see the things that people can do with food. And without further ado, I will introduce you to our speaker, Richard, Richard Campbell. Oh, wow. All right. Um, well, good afternoon. Uh, I am Dick Campbell from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And I want to start off by telling you that it's colder here than it is in Fairbanks, Alaska, <laughs> last night. It was about 20, 25 above in Fairbanks. Uh, talk, all right, we have a daughter that lives there in the last 25 years, and uh, they have a little warm spell coming through. But next week, it could be down to 30 below. You never know. <laughs> can you hear OK over there? Now you can? OK, let me get a little closer here. If, I don't know, Peg mentioned that uh, if any with hearing aids, which I have, if you have, this room is T-coiled. If you have a hearing aid with T-coil in it, it really is a help uh, in, this, in this area. For many years, I have been a, a student of history. And with this interest, I've created a variety of eight history talks about subjects of interest to me which I presented over 275 times since 1999 to local community groups and many other organizations throughout Wisconsin and even up in Fairbanks, Alaska. And now I'd like to share one of those moments with you entitled, Building the Alaska Highway. This is a dramatic story. Whoops. This is a dramatic story of courageous U.S. Army engineers and civilian contractors who toiled in the tense moments after Pearl Harbor to build a 1,500-mile emergency supply line through the rugged Canadian Rockies to isolated military bases in Alaska. Building this winding gravel military road was very much an all-American adventure. Blacks, whites, and native Alaskans worked together under the harshest extremes of, of climate and terrain, racing to booster Alaska's defenses and deter, deter Japanese attack on North American soil. This construction of the Alaska Highway forever changed the landscape of northern British Columbia, the southern Yukon Territory, and central Alaska. This is their story. 71 years ago, in the spring of 1942, 10,670 American Army soldiers invaded the Yukon Territory and Alaska ready to begin a project that one of their officers later described as the biggest and hardest job since the Panama Canal, unquote. Their assignment was to carve more than 1,500 miles of a pioneer road in eight months to be open for military traffic out of an uncharted and unmapped wilderness from Dawson Creek, British Columbia, to Fairbanks, Alaska. Alaska is one-fifth the size of the lower 48 United States. As shown on this map, the construction of the Alaska Highway would be comparable to building a road from the eastern shore of North Carolina 
to Des Moines, Iowa in eight months. Or for we Wisconsin people, a road from Oscus, Wisconsin to El Paso, Texas in eight months. The Army soldiers who were formerly shoe clerks, insurance salesmen, farm boys, and other civilian workers were put behind the wheels of bulldozers and dump trucks with little or no training and told to clear their way through a frozen wasteland. The environment in which they worked was unrentingly, unrelentingly hostile. But their biggest obstacle was time. Because America, in the wake of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, was suddenly and dangerously vulnerable. In the days following the attack, Americans feared the enemy would con coming, continue across the Pacific and attack the West Coast. The Alaskan Territory, in particular, seemed vulnerable, as its Aleutian Islands were only 750 miles from a Japanese base. It was quite conceivable, particularly to the hysterics who provided much of the public commentary during World War II, that a successful Japanese attack on Alaska would swiftly be followed by a piercing thrust to the heart of the continent. On January 16, 1942, President Franklin Roosevelt appointed a commission to study the feasibility of an overland route through the densely forested Canadian Rockies to Alaska. Then on February 11, 1942, Roosevelt authorized the U.S. Army to proceed with all haste to begin construction of a highway that would run past Fort Yukon, Fort St. John, or excuse me, Fort St. John, Fort Nelson, Watson Lake, Whitehorse, and Fairbanks, where the main, the main airfields of the Northwest Staging Route were located. It was initially named the Alaska Canadian Military Highway, the ALCAN. On March 8, 1942, construction of the highway officially began with Colonel William Hogg, commander of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, in charge. With 26 years of experience in civil engineering, Hogg's new assignment was to build this massive, primitive road through a heavily wooded, often swampy wilderness from Dawson Creek to Delta Junction, Alaska, and then on to Fairbanks, a distance of over 1,500 miles. Alaska Highway mythology has always held that the road was built by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Highway construction was regarded as a test of Yankee military ability to construct a military highway across many miles of sub-Arctic wilderness and to complete the task within eight months. But the Army did not build the entire highway, nor was it ever instructed to do so. Its task, more limited but still daunting, was to construct a pioneer road, rough and unfinished, at the earliest possible date to a standard sufficient only for the supply of troops engaged on the work." Unquote. The actual highway, a road usable by the military supply convoys destined for Alaska and for future civilian traffic, to be ready by the end of 1943 would be completed by civilian contractors working under the direction of the Public Roads Administration, the PRA. The PRA civilian contractors attempted to put their work crews together close to home. Train loads and boat loads of civilian workers and equipment traveled military style across the USA and southern Canada to their workstations in the north. These PRA construction companies had much to offer, a chance to assist the war effort while earning large sums of money. But they also knew that they were taking the workers 
into a frontier setting with few amenities. Military recruitment was reasonably logical and orderly. Engineering units assigned to the Northwest boarded troop trains and headed over the Northern Alberta Railroad with the first trains carrying supplies, equipment, and thousands of troops arriving at Dawson Creek, British Columbia on March 2, 1942. The Alaska Highway was built to connect Dawson Creek with Fairbanks, and the arrival of the engineers cost the population of the small towns along the planned route to boom. Massive tent cities grew up around these towns. Before the war, Dawson Creek was a small town of about 600 people, serving the rich farming area around it. It was named for Canadian geologist George Dawson, who led a survey party through there in 1879. The Northern Alberta Railroad had been extended to that point in 1931. The town mushroomed to over three times its pre-war size during the war years, with the invasion of soldiers in their new tent towns. 47 miles northwest of Dawson Creek was the town of Fort St. John, British Columbia. Originally established in 1806 on the banks of the Peace River as a trading post for the local Indians. The fur trade had been active in the area for many years. A northwest staging route air base was established there in 1941 and the town began to grow. 300 miles northwest of Dawson Creek, along a winter trail, was Fort Nelson, British Columbia. Another northwest staging route air base was built there. 635 miles northwest of Dawson Creek was Watson Lake, Yukon Territory, which was another northern staging route air base and a major center for highway construction. 918 miles northwest of Dawson Creek was the largest town along the highway, Whitehorse, Yukon Territory, which had been spawned by the Klondike Gold Rush 45 years earlier in 1897. It was the northern terminus of the White Pass and Yukon Railroad, which wound its way 110 miles north from Skagway, Alaska. Whitehorse was also a supply point for the river boats on the Yukon River. It was also an air base stop on the Northwest Staging Route. The Northwest Service Command was established there in 1942 to coordinate all supply construction and defense operations of the U.S. Army in that part of Canada. At 1,520 miles from Dawson Creek, was Fairbanks, Alaska, which was the final link in the highway and a very important air base during the war. It was born of the gold rush in the early 1900s and established itself as the major city in interior Alaska. It was linked to the sea by the Alaska Railroad, which ran south to Anchorage, Alaska. The Fairbanks population swelled during the war with construction workers, soldiers, and Air Force personnel who were stationed there to service aircraft that were being ferried 2,500 miles up from Great Falls, Montana on the Northwest Staging Route airfields for shipment to Russia under the World War II Lend-Lease Act. This involved flights by Russian pilots to Siberia and then on to Russian airfields. The Lend-Lease flight departed Ladd Field in Fairbanks on Sept the first Lend-Lease flight departed Ladd Field in Fairbanks on September 29, 1942. A total of 7,926 aircraft were shuttled to Russia from Fairbanks during their war with Germany from 1942 to 1945. Ships loaded with troops and cargo destined for the highway construction areas sailed into the Alaskan harbors at Skagway, 
Valdez and Seward, dropping tons of road building supplies on the docks. The White Pass and Yukon Railroad out of Skagway then carried them to Whitehorse. From Seward, the supplies went by the Alaska Railroad to Fairbanks. The Richardson Highway connecting Valdez and Fairbanks was a trucking route to Big Delta, the focus of construction activity at the north end of the highway. From the start, immense bottlenecks developed at the key transportation points. Skagway was snowed under by a storm of equipment, material, and military personnel. Many soldiers sat for several weeks in makeshift camps in the tiny coastal settlement. In what verged on being a military reenactment of the gold rush of 1898, the soldiers impatiently waited to press north, although the goal on this occasion was highway miles rather than ounces of gold. General Hogue realized that the highway could not possibly be built from a single direction and not if he hoped to come close to the target date. Consequently, he divided the route into sections, and rather than proceeding from one point and in one direction, combat regiments were posted in strategic positions along the route. Building north and south, each group would eventually meet up with other units. Their method of construction was simple. Surveyors worked roughly 10 miles ahead of the bulldozers and the men who cleared the path. The surveyors would mark the exact route, and then the men behind them would catch up and blaze a path. A battalion of bulldozers cleared the way by knocking down trees in a path roughly 50 to 90 feet across. Transporting equipment across the rough terrain was difficult, and when necessary items didn't show up, the engineers would be forced to cut trees and other vegetation by hand. And once the path was cleared, a second battalion brought up the rear, hurriedly flattening the road surface. As the realities of this task became apparent, General Hogue called for more men and more resources. With most of his engineers deployed in the South Pacific, the Corps of Engineers took the unprecedented step of assigning engineers from three all-black regiments to work with the four white regiments already deployed to Alaska. At first, the black men were given menial jobs, described as, quote, pick and shovel work, unquote. But it soon became clear that every soldier would have to be put to work road building if it were to be finished before winter. Thus, for almost the first time in history of the U.S. Army, black and white regiments performed identical tasks. Though not with identical equipment all the time, black regiments were provided with fewer bulldozers and therefore were forced to use wheelbarrows and shovels more frequently than their white counterparts. In the minds of most senior white officers, black troops were not as capable in terms of their technical efficiency and ability to use the equipment. There was an expectation that they would do poorly, but the black soldiers shown here proved to be tireless workers and made exceptional contributions to the highway's completion. The result was a practical lesson in racial equality. The soldiers of the Army and the civilians of the PRA faced countless days of below zero winter temperatures, snow, rain, insects, and even intense heat in the summertime construction period, coupled with the problems associated with building a road in an unknown environment. Living conditions were harsh. With supply trains running erratically, soldiers lived on a diet of canned field rations. They slept wherever they could. The warmth of sleeping bodies sometimes transformed frozen ground into mud overnight. 
Snow-fed mountain streams washed away campsites. Black flies swarmed the troops by day, and bears invaded their camps at night, searching for food. Equipment breakdowns during the winter months <coughs> occurred hourly. Engines ran continuously because it was difficult to start them in the cold. Engineers waded chest deep into freezing lakes to build bridge trestles, battling mosquitoes, mud, and the moss-laden Arctic bogs known as muskeg. Frostbite was a constant in the winter. The Northwest construction units encountered special challenges with permafrost, ground that had been frozen for thousands of years below the muskeg. It thawed as bulldozers exposed it to the sunlight, creating a deadly layer of muddy quicksand under the seemingly stable roadbed. Here's a good example of what permafrost, permafrost looks like. With the frozen ice section circled in red here, <coughs> permafrost brought construction to a halt in some sections, while the engineers searched for a solution. It was obvious that they needed to insulate the permafrost so it didn't melt, but no one was sure how to do it. Finally, they borrowed an idea from the past, log roads. Engineers abandoned their bulldozer, bulldozers and picked up axes to clear the forest. They let the fallen vegetation cover the thin soil of the forest and then covered it with a roadbed paved with logs. The technique called corduroy had been used as early as the Roman Empire and as recently as the American Civil War. They employed it on a heroic scale. The wooden road insulated the ground, keeping it frozen. But construction progress slowed in the building progress. The construction methods took a terrific toll in men and machines. And there were bound to be accidents along the way. One of the worst tragedies occurred at Charlie Lake near Fort St. John on May 14, 1942. Parts of the lake were still frozen, and the water surface was laced with broken, thick slabs of ice, and the temperature of the water was only slightly above freezing. The men constructed a ferry out of two pontoons and road materials to transport heavy equipment and 17 men across the nine-mile crossing. A heavy storm developed, and the craft was quickly engulfed by waves and floundered in seconds. Twelve men on the raft drowned. Other men were killed in road accidents or died from extreme cold temperatures during winter operations, when temperatures dropped to minus 50 below zero and even lower. An estimated 30 men died during the construction of the Alaska Highway. Construction gained a new sense of urgency on June, on June 3, 1942, when the Japanese attacked Dutch Harbor, an American military base in the central Aleutian Islands. Several days later, thousands of Japanese soldiers occupied the western islands of Kiska and Attu. America's worst fears had come true. The Japanese were on U.S. soil. In Alaska, the fear that Japan would gain control over the sea lanes in the Gulf of Alaska gave the Corps of Engineers new motivation to complete this highway on schedule. One of the biggest obstacles, one of the biggest problems, was the construction men encountered in building the Alaska Highway was bridging the many small streams and major rivers along the route. Over the entire stretch of highway, 133 bridges and 8,000 culverts were built. Some of the streams could be crossed with small log structures, but others, meandering glacier-fed rivers, hundreds of yards wide that turned into raging torrents during spring breaking, breakup were a real challenge. With the military necessity of opening the road as quickly as possible, 
Temporary log pontoon bridges, or pontoon bridges, were constructed over the smaller streams. And ferries were used on the larger rivers. The PRA personnel who followed to construct a more permanent road were to upgrade these bridges. After the Canadian Army assumed control of the highway in 1946, the first priorities were rebuilding some of the major bridges and replacing the hundreds of log culverts that had rotted through the years. The timber bridges over the large glacial rivers had to be replaced with steel girder type bridges as shown here. Today, only one original bridge from the Pioneer remains, shown here, crossing Canyon Creek near Haynes Junction. A word about camp life. Building a road in that remote part of the continent was very difficult for men and machines. The pressure to finish it as soon as possible did not leave much time for recreation or for admiring the scenery. It was a difficult situation for the thousands of men to be suddenly relocated to a hostile environment to fight the various problems of cold weather in the winter, inadequate living conditions, loneliness, insects, fatigue, and dangerous construction methods. Living conditions were particularly bad in the early winter period of construction. Men had to live in tents with inadequate heat in the winter and little insect protection in the summer. Supplying the food for such a large contingent of troops was a serious problem. As highway construction progressed, more suitable quarters were built and better food was obtained. In June 1942, there was a need to secure civilian workers for building an auxiliary road to support the construction and maintenance of an oil pipeline to Whitehorse, Yukon. Contractors posted this sign at hiring halls recruiting for the Canole Pipeline Project, as it was called, and workers reported that it did not understate the difficulties encountered. Quote, this is no picnic. Working in living conditions on this job are as difficult as those encountered on any construction job ever done in the United States or foreign territory. Men hired for this job will be required to work and live under the most extreme conditions imaginable. Temperature will range from 90 degrees above zero to 70 degrees below zero. Men will have to fight swamps, rivers, ice, and cold. Mosquitoes, flies, and gnats will not only be annoying, but will cause bodily harm. If you are not prepared to work under these and similar condition, do not apply." Unquote. Cold weather was probably the hardest thing to become accustomed to. Most of the men had never experienced such extreme temperatures ranges, and the worst of the cold it was and in the worst of the cold it was very dangerous to work around the machines. Flesh wood could be frozen hard to metal if touched in a matter of seconds. And ice water was always a hazard in building the bridges if one were to fall in. In consideration of these adverse conditions, it's a tribute to the men that the highway was built in record time. Slowly, the gaps between the separate sections of the highway closed. By the end of August, the Pioneer Road between Dawson Creek and Fort Nelson was complete. By the end of September, the highway went as far as Whitehorse, just 166 miles from the American border. Only the toughest section of the road remained. At the beginning of October, temperatures dropped sharply. What would be one of the coldest winter Alaskan winters on record had arrived, with temperatures approaching minus 50 degrees below zero and lower. Many members of the all-black 97th Engineers, the team assigned to the northernmost section of the highway, had grown up in the deep south and had never seen a snowflake. Now they worked in temperatures severe enough to kill a man in minutes. 
Arctic winds and blizzards slowed construction to a crawl. Snow drifts were often 20 feet high. It was so cold that it was hard to breathe and metal eyeglass frames froze onto men's faces. With the end relatively near, the two regiments, one black, the 97th, and one white, the 18th, struggled to finish before conditions grew from horrific to impossible. The final race to close the distance between the two units took place on October 25, 1942, when they met head-on in the forest at Beaver Creek, 20 miles east of the boundary between Alaska and the Canadian Yukon. A bulldozer technician with the all-black 97th engineers was driving his machine south when the trees in front of him toppled. He slammed his bulldozer in reverse just as a second bulldozer driven by the lead driver of the all-white 18th engineers broke through the trees. The two men jumped off their machines to shake hands, a moment captured on film by one of their fellow soldiers. This photograph of the two grinning, grimy soldiers made newspapers across America and Canada. A picture that celebrated not only the triumph completion of the Pioneer Road, but the first step toward desegregation of the American military. The black soldiers had demonstrated that they were equal to the whites in their construction efforts. In just eight months and 12 days, General Hoag's men working through extreme weather with sparse training and inadequate supplies laid 1,520 miles of rough highway through the dangerous wilderness. On November 20, 1942, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers celebrated the completion of the Pioneer Road at Soldier's Summit, a short distance south of Kluani Lake in the western Yukon Territory. Temperature stood at minus 15 degrees below zero. With many dignitaries present and heedless of the numbing cold, General James O'Connor did his best to make the ceremony a memorable celebration with the following comment, quote, The road was a bond between the United States, Canada, and Alaska of incalculable incalcul significance for the future of the soldiers and civilians who had built it. These men, he speculated, would tell their children of the building of the road, and as the tales grew taller and taller, it was possible that the Alaska Highway might become an American saga ranking with the epics of John C. Fremont and Lewis and Clark." Unquote. It was a feat befitting the completion of a major international construction project. Journalists from across North America attended, and the ceremonies were broadcast live by radio. By 1943, the threat of a Japanese invasion had waned due to the reversals on all fronts in the South Pacific. The need for the highway was not as critical as during the early days of 1942. The U.S. Army was responsible for maintenance of the road, but by 1944, the work was reduced to around 500 men, all Canadian civilians. The idea of building an all-weather highway with high standards was abandoned for the time being, and only essential re relocation work was authorized, with all work by the PRA to be phased out by the end of October 1943. The problems encountered by the initial construction crews were inherited by the civilian workers, especially the icing conditions and washouts. Bridges were a continual problem as dozens were washed out in 1943 and 1944. It was a constant battle to keep the highway open with the adverse weather conditions limiting funding and manpower. In April 1946, the Royal Canadian Army officially took over operation and maintenance of the road. There was little usable construction equipment left, 
and only a small workforce to oversee the 1,200 miles of road in Canada. There was an immediate need to upgrade the road and bridges as there were, was pressure to open the road to civilian use. Civilian traffic was restricted in 1946 and 1947, and the road was open for a time in 1948, but had to close because of high number of car breakdowns. By 1949, the highway was open on a full-time basis with tourist facilities being expanded every year thereafter. April 1, 1964 saw the highway's military administration come to an end and the Department of Public Works took over the Canadian portion of the road. The Alaska portion was maintained by the Alaska Road Commission. Traffic on the Alaska Highway was already substantial by the summertime of 1964. At mile 1202, Total two-way traffic for 1964 topped 41,000 vehicles, a significant increase over the roughly 25,000 cars and trucks which had passed that point 10 years earlier. American use of the highway remained very high. Today, the Alaska Highway remains the only land route to Alaska from the lower 48 states. In summary, the Alaska Highway Project was one of the outstanding demonstrations of the fortitude, perseverance, and indomitable spirit of the American soldier. Long, hard work, hours of work under the worst possible conditions of living were the primary reasons for the accomplishment of the mission. All possible credit for the task should go to the soldier in the field who, without complaining, often not too well fed or clothed, and with no means at his disposal for ordinary comforts, cooperated with his fellow soldiers in chopping out the highway by brute strength. Incidentally, by one estimate, the wartime construction cost of the Alaska Highway was $138 million about $93,000 per mile, the largest and most expensive construction project during the war. And now you know the rest of the story. And one last picture of which those that might be interested, I've mentioned going to Fairbanks. Here's a MapQuest picture of today's driving directions and estimated mileage from Oshkosh, Wisconsin to Fairbanks, Alaska. It's a distance of over 3,300 miles now and at least 60 hours of drive time if you'd like to drive that route, primarily in the spring, summer, and fall, although it's open, I guess, year round. Okay, and here's some of uh, my uh, copy of some of the resources I used in putting this uh, talk together, and some of those books are over on the table to my right. Uh, and are there any? Comments or questions? Um, raise your hand if you've been to Alaska. We are good group. Raise, raise your hand if you've driven any part or all of the. You, my God, that's any, how many all the whole route. Re, pardon? From uh, Watson Lake to, or from uh, Dawson Creek to Fairbanks? You have. When in what years? I'm just curious. Two thousand nine. Nine, not too long. Yes. Um, my dad was stationed at Elmendorf Air Force Base, uh, and we lived there in the, the 50s. We lived there before it was a state. Oh, really? So the, the Elkan was uh, all gravel road. Uh, yeah, had, it was, yeah. Yeah. We, had, we always had a bug screen on the car. The bugs were so bad, it went all Take the way across the A couple extra grid. tires and equipment. <laughs> Gas yeah, stations were really very far apart. Anybody driven it when they, you had breakdowns? Anybody? Oh, you got a license. 1967. <laughs> Tell me about it. Well, I was stationed up there in the service. And I um, was at uh, Fort Richardson, which is right next to Elmendorf. And um, <laughs> I, I had uh, uh, tell a part of the story. But, uh, the first day I got up to Alaska was the day we shot Kennedy. And, uh,
I'm going to have you use this. <laughs> the first day I got up to Alaska was the day they shot Kennedy. And I was in the uh, office where they were processing my papers in. And a guy come from the back of the office there, and he says, guess what? They just shot the president, and everybody was just in disbelief almost, you know. And uh, so, uh, of course, any smart general running the post here says, well, what should we do? Well, let's have a parade. <laughs> so we're out there marching around in our <coughs> long trench coats and our rubber boots and stuff in the snow. But um, and then the next spring, we had another nice little event up there. They had that bad earthquake up there, which about nine point oh, something or other. 64. Yeah. 19. Oh, that was terrible. Because uh, I was in the mess hall that day, and uh, the chief uh, of the mess hall there, he says, oh, don't worry, guys. We have these every once in a while. Well, when the pots and pans started falling off the wall, he th thought it was time to get out. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> <clears throat> but then uh, when my time of duty was up up there, and we spent many, well, I, I think I spent about at least two or three times up near Fairbanks in mm -hmm. the cold, cold. They always had these almost always in the, like in January or February, they have what they call a maneuver, which, like you said, it could get down to 70 below. Well, I think the coldest I saw it was maybe 50. Mm -hmm. So, um and uh, then when my time come to get out, I had a car when I was up there. I, uh, before I left home, I had my parents sell my old car, and they sent me the money up, and I bought a car up there. So I had, you know, chance to drive quite a few places around Alaska. And then I had to drive down the uh, Elkan Highway, which at that time was still um, about 800 miles of gravel. What they call gravel there was more like baseballs. So, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I had to go all the way down to Fort Lewis, Washington to get discharged. They wouldn't discharge you up there, otherwise I could have maybe oh, took a couple right. shortcuts, you know. Oh. And um, got down to Fort Lewis on a uh, Friday and uh, about four o'clock in the afternoon, they says, well, you're too late. We're close enough. Come back Monday. <laughs> oh, my. So I got a chance to visit the Space Needle there, and mm -hmm. I drove up on Mount Hood or whatever that tall mountain is in the back there mm -hmm. and and stuff like that. And okay. Went through a few of the beauty spots in North America on the way home. <laughs> oh, great. Well, you know, you know how you can tell when it's at least 50 below is you fill your glass in front of you with water and open your back door and throw it up in the air and it crystallizes before it gets, hits the ground. Our daughter has done that for us many times out of her back door. And uh, it does, it just freezes right away. Any other neat little stories that anybody has? Yes. It, it's pretty... As far as I understand, it's it's completely paved now. I oh believe. yeah, well we need yeah. some gravel, construction gravel areas, and that's no different than in the United States. Yeah. Uh, you always hit those signals, <coughs> but generally speaking, mm -hmm. the roads are very good. That's what I've heard. I'm, I've driven parts of it uh, north of Skagway over to Toke, and uh, it was pretty. And that was yeah. back about 20 years ago, and it was pretty good shape, shape then. Anything else that any nice be? Yes. I just want to say when we did come back, the Peace River Bridge had had collapsed before we came back, and we had to go over the Peace River on a railroad track. Oh, really? Yeah. So it was, you know, like so many cars one way, and then they stopped it. Oh my road. goodness! Oh my goodness! Well, I'm amazed here. There's a lot of folks in this room that's had the Alaskan experience. That's great. I tell people every day in Alaska is a wow day, as far as I'm concerned, and. Uh, my wife, Marilyn, and I go up and generally to visit our daughter every year in February or March. And um, one of the people said, what's the matter with you? And I said, well, you don't have to contend with any tourists in February and March, <laughs> which is true. But Fairbanks is such a wonderful community and wonderful people. And, and uh, it's, we're planning to go up again 
in this coming March, hopefully. And any other comments or questions that anybody has? Yes. Well, I have a question about yeah. the, uh, it seems to me that was an enormous and impressive collaboration between the U.S. and the Canadian government mm -hmm. to, to do that together. I would, I would think and so. surely that was historical, I would, that yeah. collaboration. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about it? Not, yeah. not really. More there, there may be some people in the room that might have some respond. But, but yes, I'm a, I certainly imagine that that uh, had to be done ahead of time. But you know what's amazing to me is, you know, when you decide to build something today, how long does it take? About one, two, three, five years to do all the permits and surveys? Roosevelt said, we need a highway to Fairbanks. Two months later, they're working on the highway. That, that's, that's amazing to me. <laughs> They, I don't think they even bothered with permits. They just went through. They didn't even know where the road was going to go to get permits, as you heard, which is amazing. <laughs> but in, yeah, in two months, well, Pearl Harbor in December and here in February, they're building this highway. That just uh, amazes me. Okay. Back to you. And, uh, Dick will be here for a few minutes after the program, so if you want to come up and tell stories and talk about Alaska, you can certainly feel free to do that. Don't forget, next month we have um, an African adventure, and uh, a little bit warmer maybe than the one we talked about today. Um, so I hope you'll join us. Remember to um, give generously to the Friends of the Library for the meal that was provided wanna, by Subway today. You want to plan think about the next one? Oh. Well, Maybe and, and Dick's that, talking about coming back in May I, and talking about Battle of Midway. I just so completed I know we, my eighth talk on the uh, remembering the Battle of Midway, which was the turning point, uh, one of the major turning points of World War II, a naval battle uh, that between uh, American and Japanese forces at Midway. And um, it's an amazing story. So sometime in, in May, okay, that would be great. Okay, thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. And have a wonderful holiday with your families and come to the library. Thank you.